people have found who express their faith. Some of them have expressed their faith by writing prayers, and some of them have written music, and some of them have made decorations to hang on a tree to remind us of the story of Jesus. We give you thanks for all of these ways that we have of learning more and drawing closer to you. Amen. Thanks for coming down and helping me finish up the tree decorating. You can go back to your seats now. The gospel reading today is from the gospel of Matthew in the 24th chapter uh, beginning in verse 36 through verse 44. Jesus is the one speaking throughout this passage. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken away, and one will be left. Keep away, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief would come, He would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this first Sunday in Advent, isn't wonderful to walk into this sanctuary and see it so beautifully uh, decorated? Because I was away last week. I wasn't in the church until just this morning, and it's like magic. Is And I know it's not. I know there are a lot of people who've spent a lot of time, and, and thank you to all of you who have done such a beautiful job decorating. But I also thought about, maybe we should recommend that as a Hallmark holiday movie, the decorating of the sanctuary. Can't you just see it? All the members of the congregation would be there and they'd be wearing Christmas sweaters and they'd be having cookies and cocoa and it would all be happy and joyful. There would not be a debate about whether or not the wise men should be in the crash scene or not. Theological debate about the appropriateness of wise men and stables. No, no, there would be delight as people were joyfully fluffing out the, the greenery and and a little giggle as two of the teenagers go to put chrismons on the tree at the same time and they touch hands and they just giggle because it's so fun and naughty all at the same time. And then in the course of the evening, it would be an old man who walked in, a stranger off the street because this is such a wonderful time. He's welcomed in. He's given his own cup of cocoa and his own cookie and invited to put some decorations on the tree. And he puts one on that nobody notices at first and disappears. And then everything is done. People are delightedly sitting in the sanctuary, admiring their work and complimenting one another about how beautiful it is when somebody notes the envelope goes over and pulls it off the tree, opens it, pulls it out. It's the banknote on the building, and it says across it, paid in full. And the congregation knows that without knowing it, they had entertained an angel. Oh, it's been done? Well, I thought it was a pretty good idea, and it would make a pretty good good movie. Uh... But, you know, one of the things, those Hallmark movies can be a little bit cheesy, um, but they remind us about the beauty of this season. And one of the parts of the beauty of this season is, of course, this idea of being at peace, being at peace with one another. 
and the setting of the sanctuary and the happy gathering of the congregation and the sharing even of the cocoa is a reminder that we seek peace in this season. However, you and I also know that this has not been a particularly peaceful time. I rem refer, of course, to the shooting deaths in Charlottesville and in Chesapeake, Virginia, and in Colorado Springs. And because I was in Colorado Springs on vacation at the time of the shooting, that one is weighed particularly heavily upon me. I don't know how that was reported in the national news. I don't know how it was reported locally in our local news. But an interesting thing, in Colorado Springs, the people talked about Club Q using this word, sanctuary. Club Q was, for the LBGT community, a sanctuary. Now, when you and I think of sanctuary, a variety of images might come to mind. Hopefully, one would be this place where, where we gather. We consider this to be sacred space, which of course begs the question, what makes a particular space sacred? Well, part of what makes this space sacred is we really do come here to connect our lives to God, to say and sing prayers, to listen to the scriptures, to participate in the sacraments, and to gather together as a community for those rites of passage like marriage or, or death. But there's another understanding of sanctuary, and that is sanctuary is a place of protection. Someone will go to a church seeking sanctuary, seeking protection. You might go to an, the U.S. Embassy if you were in a foreign country, and you would go there for protection. Countries can be sanctuaries, a place of protection. So it's a different meaning of the word, but still that sense that a place of protection can be sacred, even if it was never set aside for a particularly sacred purpose. But feeling safe can be a sacred thing. And perhaps that's what the people who went to Club Q felt was that it was a safe and sacred place where they were protected from judgment, they were protected from shame, they were protected from ridicule. Uh, it was a place of sanctuary for them and a place of peace until it wasn't. In Advent, we pray for this gift of peace and yet we know that peace is, if not entirely temporary, at least elusive. Listen to these words again from Isaiah. God shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It's a vision of peace that's nearly 3,000 years old. Isaiah lived in the 8th century. He lived after the reign of King David and King Solomon when Israel was a strong and united nation. In fact, at the time of Isaiah, it has split into two countries, north and south, and every spring, when the weather gets better, nations go to war. And slowly and surely, other nations around are nibbling off little bits of the people. So the hope was for a Messiah, someone sent from God who could do what the king couldn't. Someone who would restore the nation to, to grandeur and glory. Someone who would bring about a lasting peace so that the weapons of war might be reshaped by a blacksmith into farming implements. 
to grow crops, feed families. It's a compelling vision. It is so compelling that it is not only found in Isaiah, but almost word for word repeated in the book of Micah. This vision, this beating swords to plowshares, has come down as a compelling image for 3,000 years. Someplace along my way in choral singing, there was an anthem based upon this text. I don't remember where it was that I sang it or with what choir. I don't remember the composer. I can sing the major part of that chorus simply from memory because it is such a compelling image and such a compelling piece of music. And yet here we are again, numb from an incident where peace was broken and sanctuary shattered. So if we all long for peace, if we have had this vision that there should be peace for 3,000 years now, why can't we get there? I don't think we're capable. I think we're human beings. And human beings have an emotion, and one of our primary emotions is the emotion of fear. You know, when you're little, you might be scared of the dark. When you're in your teenage years, you fear being cut off from the group, or you fear that next test coming in algebra. And when you're an adult, holy cow, you worry about everything, don't you? I mean, what is there not to... You worry about your health. You worry about the economy. You worry about your savings. You worry about your retirement plan. You worry about your kids, no matter how old your kids are and how grown up they are and how they seem to be doing fine on their own, but you still worry about them, right? And, and you worry about the roof and the foundation and the dadgum kitchen appliances, Right? The garbage disposal, the dishwasher, the trash compactor, the ice maker, the refrigerator, the freezer, any of those things could break at any point in time. We worry about all that stuff. Wouldn't it be nice if all we had to do to stop worrying about stuff was to have a nightlight to throw away the dark? But instead, we buy extended warranties home security systems. Maybe I shouldn't have hung up on that person that was calling me about extending the warranty on my car. Somehow we think that all of that protection will bring us peace. I think it just ramps up our anxiety. Do I have enough insurance coverage? I got that little camera thing by my front door, but I hear there's one that's more pixelated that I could get that would be even better. Yeah. So we do not have a capacity to bring about a lasting peace. We want to protect ourselves from all harm, believing that Safety and peace are the same thing, and I, I don't think that works quite that way. So the image, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, 3,000 years old. People have longed for peace for 3,000 years. And the promise is that that day will indeed come. Isaiah says, in the days to come, in God's time, not ours. That's really disappointing. In God's time, not ours. When I first moved to Corpus Christi, Ray Cross thought it would be a good thing for uh, me to have a, a, a lesson in Spanish around the word manana. Now he said to me, Alan, some people think that manana means tomorrow. That is not what manana means. And some people think manana means some indefinite time in the future. 
That's not what manana means. Manana means not now. When will they beat their swords into plowshares? Manana. Not now. But there is a biblical concept about time that is different from our Western understanding of time. It is the idea that something can be present at a particular moment, but not yet fully developed. It can be present here, but, but the fullness of its expression is going to be off in the future. The phrase that's sometimes used around it is the already, but not yet. Already here, but not yet fully here. So let's use that one on our theme of peace. So I hope that when you come here into the sanctuary, you come to connect with God and you come to connect with one another. You come to pray and you come to praise God. And we hope that we will be surrounded by God's peace. And not all the time, because we get distracted. But sometimes it happens that here in the sanctuary, in the course of a service of worship, we really feel that peace that passes understanding. And if we're lucky, we take it with us out of the door of the sanctuary into the next week. We enjoy it. We love it. We know it's not going to last. Something along the way will disturb and upset that peace. So we experience peace and we long for an eternal peace, a peace that will surround us at all times. Peace is already here, but not yet fully here. So we await that day when they will beat their weapons into farming tools and that will come in God's time. In our time, we can seek to be the bearers of peace in the world. That's certainly what we see Jesus doing. When Jesus eats dinner with an outcast, he's bringing peace. When Jesus heals a woman with a crippled lame condition, he's bringing peace. When Jesus welcomes children, he's bringing peace. When Jesus refuses to judge and instead forgives, he's bringing peace. Now, you and I may not be able to do healings, but we can do a lot of that other stuff, can't we? We can forgive. We can decide, I'm not going to pass judgment. We can welcome the stranger into our midst. We can feed the hungry, clothe the naked. We can welcome children. Each of those actions brings peace. Not swords into plowshares peace, but peace nonetheless. The phrase be the change you want to see in the world is often attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, but he didn't really say it, but I think he would endorse it. And I think Jesus would too. Be the change you want to see in the world. If you want peace, then be a person who bears peace in the world. Amen.
please join me in the affirmation of faith from the Scots Confession. When the fullness of time came, God sent his Son, his eternal wisdom, the substance of his own glory, into this world, who took the nature of humanity from the substance of a woman, a virgin, by means of the Holy Ghost. And so was born the just seed of David, the angel of the great council of God, the very Messiah promised, whom we confess and acknowledge to be Emmanuel, true God and true man, two perfect natures united and joined in one person. Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, we have barely pushed back from the Thanksgiving dinner table and discovered that it's Advent. But before we move on, thank you. Thank you for those who came before us and thought that it was important to set aside a day to give thanks. Of course, we have muddled things up with football games and shopping trips, but we still know that at the core there is an opportunity to be grateful for all that we have. Perhaps we could have paused longer in our gratitude on Thursday. So we take a moment right now to offer you our prayers of grateful thanksgiving. Now this sanctuary is decorated and the first candle has been lit on the Advent wreath. And the music of worship is anticipatory. While so much of the world charges ahead and the Christmas rush is taken over our calendars, we are encouraged to wait. 
Advent calls us to wait with quiet anticipation. Help us this day and in the weeks ahead to find a moment to simply pray, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, to heal those who are hurting. Come, Lord Jesus, and comfort those who grieve. Come, Lord Jesus, and bless families with embracing love. Come, Lord Jesus, and bring unity when there is estrangement. Come, Lord Jesus, and make all things new. Come, Lord Jesus, that they might turn their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Come, Lord Jesus. Now with the confidence of the children of God, we boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you are here in the sanctuary and have a financial donation you'd like to make to the uh, church, we have only one offering box today. I have looked all around to figure out where the second one was, and I can't find it anywhere. So uh, there is an offering box that you can put uh, your offering in. For those of you who are watching online, if you would like to give financial support to our ministry, there are a couple of ways to do that. You can simply capture the QR code that's on the screen, or you can go to our church website, parkwaypc.org, go to that Give tab, and then just follow the prompts underneath it. This season also gives us uh, additional opportunities uh, to give. You can help provide for a child whose family is a client of Presbyterian Children's Homes and Services through our gingerbread tree. You take a child's name and buy a gift for that child, bring it back here, and then the social worker with Presbyterian Children's Homes and Services will make sure that child receives that gift. Uh, you can give a gift to someone for whom a gift is not necessary, but you would like to honor them anyway. That's the idea behind our mission market, an alternative gift where you can make a donation and specify it to go to one of three organizations to the Good Samaritan Rescue Mission, to Foster Angels of South Texas or Heifer International, and then you are provided a card to give to the person you are honoring with that gift. And you can also give to the Presbyterian Church's Christmas Joy Offering. Uh, this is an offering that's received in Presbyterian churches across the United States. The proceeds of this offering are divided between two programs, one with the Board of Pensions of the Presbyterian Church that provides emergency grants to retired church workers, and the other uh, portion of the offering goes in support of the racial ethnic schools of our denomination, including Presbyterian Pan American School in neighboring Kingsville, Texas. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you always have enough for everything you may share abundantly in every good work. Let us pray together. Generous God, through the ages, people have supported the ministry of Jesus Christ by gifts, gifts to the church, and we pray that you would help this church to wisely use the funds entrusted to us for the proclamation of the gospel, for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Amen.
to hate Be the change you want to see in the world. If you want to see peace, be a peace bearer. If you want to know what that looks like, look to Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.